All right, Genesis chapter 8. The part I just want to focus in on uh, is just found there right at the end in verse number 21. The Bible says, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every li everything living as I have done. And what I'm going to be preaching on this evening is the sins of the youth. The sins of the youth. And this is why I said this morning, you know, uh, in this morning's sermon, I got a, I'm preaching a sermon now. It's applicable to everybody. When we're preaching tonight, everyone's going to be able to walk away with. But I, I really, really want the kids to listen up and to pay attention to this sermon because this is a really important sermon for you. And, and I can't stress enough how much I, I, you, could, you could learn from this as a young person and how important this is going to be in your life just in general because you're going to grow up and have a lot of decisions to make. And the Bible talks about there's many people in Scripture that lament, they feel bad about, they're sorry for the, the sins that they had done in their youth. And oftentimes people will, will be feeling like when they go through real hard times later in life, like, oh man, the sins of my youth basically have caught up with me. God is rebuking me. God's punishing me for the sins of my youth. Because what happens when you're youthful, when you're young, you know, young people don't have the same wisdom and knowledge that older people do. And this is one of the reasons why God stresses, and it's really important, that younger people, you know, you honor your father and your mother. You listen to the people. You rise up before the hoary head. You give respect to those that are older than you. They've been around a lot longer on this earth. They have something that they can teach you. And that's, we, we ought to be showing that level of respect. And as you grow and as you learn, you, usually right around the time of the teenage years is when children have a tendency to think that they know everything. And one of the reasons for that is because as a child, you know you don't really know a lot. There's a lot of mistakes that you make and, and you know, the, the, the younger children don't really think on that level. But when you start becoming capable of thinking on a much higher level and, you, and start gaining more intelligence, because you're older, because you're, you're becoming a young man or a young woman, and, and you're getting to this point of actually being able to have really intelligent conversations and able to learn a lot more, and you see a lot more, you kind of have a feeling like, well, now I'm just like, I'm, I'm an adult. You know, I just turned 18, so I'm just like every other adult. No, you, you may be an adult, or you'll be held responsible like every other adult, but there's still a lot to learn in life. There's a real lot to learn, and it, it, you'd be wise to take heed and take instruction from those around you that are older, from mom and dad, especially the people who actually care about you. I, I mean, it, <laughs> teenagers have a tendency to think they know more than their parents do. Yeah. Well, I know what's better. They, they're old. They don't know what they're talking about. Mom and dad, you know, blah, blah. blah. I've heard that before. I'll be okay. Uh, they don't, you know... Take a step back and listen to what mom and dad have to say. Really. Because when you start having that attitude of being dismissive of what your parents have to say and what, what you know, a pastor at church, well, he's just this old-fashioned guy anyways. He's always yelling about something. What does he know? You know, we care about you. I care about you. I want you not to make mistakes in your life. And too often, people, when they're young will make decisions and make mistakes that stay with you for the rest of your life. And you cannot undo the things that are done. There are decisions that people have made that your entire life is altered because of one thing that you've done when you were young you can't take back. All it takes is one bad decision to completely change and even ruin your life. Now, thank God, God is able to use people who have ruined their lives in the past. I don't want this to sound like, you know, there's just zero hope if you've made mistakes. 
But the point is to get you to think about it so that you don't make those mistakes. You don't want to be in the situation of having to, you know, salvage what you can from your life to move forward. How about you just build that great life now without making all those mistakes? And one of the ways you're going to do that is you're going to have to be humble enough to listen to those that are older than you, especially those that are older spiritually and know the Bible. The Bible tells us in Genesis 8, 21, the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. People aren't inherently good people. It's not like our nature is just automatically good. It's not. The imagination, if you let your heart just run wild and just listen to what your heart says, even from your youth, it's evil. And this is, this is what the Bible says right after God wipes out everything living on earth except for Noah and what, what survived on the ark. That's it. God just destroyed everything. That's how far things had gotten out of control. Why? Because man's heart is wicked. And man allowed his heart to take over and just get involved in all manner of wickedness. God's attitude hasn't changed. You don't want to be destroyed like the people on the earth were destroyed previously. Obviously, he's not going to flood the earth again, but we need to first recognize, hey, man's heart is evil. We need to keep ourselves in check and, and not make foolish decisions. Turn, if you would, please, to Psalm 25. We're going to look at a few instances in Scripture where men of God are bringing up the fact that, you know, they have these sins from their youth. And I think everybody has sins from their youth. Nobody's perfect. However, you have an opportunity in this church to hear wisdom that many of us as adults never heard in our youth. Now, some people have. I didn't grow up. I grew up with some wisdom, with some good teachings, but definitely not strong enough, not hard enough, and not everything. And parents, no, this is applicable to everyone. Parents, give your children the best opportunity that they can to teach them, to get through them. And, and children, listen to your parents. They love you. They care about you. You should know that. You should experience that from them. They're looking out for you. Whether or not you think they're right, you respect them enough to listen to them and, and at least give them the respect. Hey, they've been around a long time. Kids, you're, you're 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Think about how much more you know than a five-year-old, than a three-year-old. And you might only be 10 years older than them. How much older are your parents than you? Don't think that your level of understanding is going to be exactly the same as someone who's 20 years older than you. Because it's not. And you know what? That applies even to me. I'm 42 years old. People who are 60, 65, 70 years old have been around a lot longer than I have. 20 years older than me, that's half of my life. Someone's been around longer, an extra half of my life. Consider that. Now, not every old person is wise, granted. Okay, not every old person is wise, but you, do, you gain wisdom two ways. One, in the best way, is through Scripture. But number two is just through experience. Being around for a while. So you, you at least have that from people who have been around a while. If they haven't been in the Scripture, at least they've been around for a long time. But when someone has a lot of experience and, and years under their belt of learning God's Word, living God's Word, eating, breathing, sleeping God's Word, listen up. It's, it, it's, it's really important to, to try to gain and learn what you can. And don't think that you know everything. Nobody knows everything. We all can stand to learn. Look at Psalm 25, verse number 6. We have the psalmist here pleading with God, Remember, O Lord, remember thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they have been ever of old. He's going to God saying, God, God remember how merciful you are? Remember, remember, you know, 
Remember that. I want you to be thinking about that, God. Think about your mercies and your, and your, and your long suffering with me. Verse number seven. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. God, God can we just forget about that? I'd rather not think about those things. Remember the mercy. Don't remember the sins of my youth. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Here we have, you know, this is a psalm of David. David saying, you know, God, please just show mercy on me. Don't remember the sins of my youth. Wouldn't it be better to say, to not have to be worried about saying, remember not the sins of my youth? And just, and just have that clearer conscience and, and like he has in other places, hey, judge me, O oh God. Because, yeah, as you grow older, hopefully you're growing spiritually too and, and not getting involved in, in the same sins that maybe you had done when you didn't have the wisdom. But as parents, we ought to be looking to the kids to teach them, give them as much wisdom as they can, make them spiritually more mature than they are for their age. That will help them out too. And, and kids, achieve, strive for that. You can't control how fast your body grows. But you do have, you do have some control on how fast you grow spiritually. Right. How much are you willing to invest in that? Do you want to grow up and be an adult? Be a wise person. As we saw in Psalm 119 this morning, he was saying, uh, in Psalm 119 it says, I, I'm, I have more wisdom than my instructors. I'm you know, more wise than my teachers. That comes from growing spiritually and growing in God's word and understanding the true wisdom of God even more than people who might even be older than you. But the key is going to be that you're growing spiritually. Growing by learning God's word, studying God's word, and practicing God's word. That's how you're going to continue to receive Verse number eight, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, will he teach sinners in the way? The meek will he guide in judgment and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. Turn to Job 13. Job, at the beginning of the book of Job, is a man who's well-established, a man who's flourished uh, financially. He's had many children, ten children. He's got a wife, a family, a successful business. He's, he's doing really well on this earth, and he's living uprightly. When we meet with Job, man, there's not a, basically a greater on the earth. He's, he's got everything going really well in his life. But you know what we see from Job also? As all these bad things happening to him, he starts thinking back like, oh great, are the sins of my youth catching up with me? Look at Job 13, verse 21. Bible reads, Withdraw thine hand far from me, and let not thy dread make me afraid. Then call thou, and I will answer. Or let me speak, and answer thou me. How many are mine iniquities and sins? Make me to know my transgression and my sin. Wherefore hidest thou thy face and holdest me for thine enemy? Wilt thou break a leaf, driven to and fro? And wilt thou pursue the dry stubble? For thou writest bitter things against me and makest me to possess the iniquities of my youth. He's saying, you know, first of all, he's saying, well, how, what are my iniquities? What are, you know, how many do I have, God? Because he's, you know, he's really going through the ringer when Satan attacks him. And he's just trying to understand this, like, make me know my transgression. Let me know my sin, at least. I want to get this right. Why are you hiding your face? You know, I'm like a leaf, just broken, just to and fro in the wind. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm out here, Lord. And then he's saying that you're making me to possess the iniquities of my youth. The sins that I've done in my youth now are coming back home to Ruth. So that's the only thing he could think of because at this point he had been doing so many things right and he's just thinking like, well, it must just be from, from the sins I had committed in my youth. Such a man as Job even is worried about iniquities that he had done in his youth. The reason why I'm bringing these up, you can have great men of God that, that you, you, you know, in adulthood are doing great things. 
are still thinking about iniquities of the youth. So again, this shows you, you can be still, you can still have a, a use of God, but you don't want to have this thought or this fear or even have the repercussions do that do come back to you. Turn to, um, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. I'm going to read from Jeremiah 31 for you. You're turning to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Jeremiah 31, 18 says, I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus, Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised, as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. And after that I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. Time after time, we're seeing people just, just worried about the sins of their youth, what they, you know, the iniquities that they've done when they're young. As I mentioned earlier, you know, the decisions that you make when you're young, they'll stay with you for the rest of your lives. Sometimes even small decisions you don't know, they're going to they're gonna guide the course of what you're going to do with the rest of your life. For better or for worse. Look at Ecclesiastes 11, verse number 8. The Bible says, But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. And what we're seeing here, basically, in Ecclesiastes is saying, you know, hey, it's great to be young, right? Just, yeah, be, be happy in the fact that you're young, you've got energy, you've got all kinds of things that you can do, you've got your whole life in front of you. And he says, and it's kind of mockingly, though, because he's saying, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Have fun in your youth. That's why he says, um, walk in the ways of thine heart. And that's why we started off in Genesis showing that you know, the, the, the ways of man's heart is wicked. Right. Yeah, you're young. No one can stop you. You're invincible, right? Because that's what a lot of young people think. You, you're strong. You don't, have, you don't feel some of the weaknesses that come with age. When you're, when you're young, you start getting into your prime and you're like, man, nothing can stop me. I can do whatever. And you start taking a lot more risks and, and whatever and you're just going off, walking in the ways of your heart and the sight of my eyes. Well, whatever I see, I'm going to do. You're just kind of having that type of an attitude, being young, you know, the, the, the same attitude that goes along with like, you know, the rock and roll. Oh, yeah, we're, we're young. We're not going to take it. You know, we want to party all day and all night, and we're going to do, you know, just, just, just going at it. We got all this energy. We can do whatever we want. That's the, the dumb, foolish, youthful attitude that's going to destroy. He says, sure, go ahead. Yeah, go, go off and have your fun. You're young. Yep, nothing's going to stop you. He says, but remember, just know that for all these things, God's going to bring you into judgment. And, and the youth, especially the youth in this church, the youth that have parents, the youth that are saved, your parents are guiding you and teaching you you're having a better advantage that, than most in this world, of whom much is given, of, of, of the same shall much be required. God's given you great opportunities. God's given you a, a, a great family, a great church, people who care about you. God's given you this instruction from people that, that, that want you to learn. There's going to be more required of you. The more you know and the more you've grown, God's not going to take it easy on you when you start making foolish decisions and start going off into iniquity. Don't be deceived by the wickedness of this world. Don't be deceived by it. And this wasn't in my notes, but... There's, there's multiple passages that talk about, you know, hey, I see the wicked. They seem to get away with everything. They seem to be the ones having all kinds of fun. 
And here I am stuck in this fundamentalist church and there's all these rules and I can't do anything and I can't go to these concerts and you can't, I can't go out to the bar and I can't do this and I can't do that. Watch out for that attitude. There's a reason for that. As I mentioned this morning, it's not because you know, your parents or we don't want you to have any fun. It's because destruction comes in those lifestyles, in, in those things that seem to be so much fun. Don't feel like you need to test everything for yourself. That is probably the biggest problem that, that most people have is not being able to learn from God's Word and instead having to learn by doing, by going through it themselves. No, 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 that's not going to happen to me. Yes, it will. Learn it from the people who have already made the mistakes in the Scripture. Learn it from other people who have already made the mistakes. Learn it from people like me. Look, I've been down the road. I've been down the path. Oh, you think it's so cool to do drugs? Oh, you think it's so cool to drink all that booze? It's not cool. Okay, it's just going to hurt. It's going to destroy your body. It's going to make you say dumb things. It's going to make you say stupid things. And it's going to turn your heart into, into having, being perverted and saying perverted things and thinking perverted things. Things are just not right. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. Children, we want you to be wise. We want you to be smart. Spend time in the book of Proverbs. Very applicable book. Pure wisdom. Real basic stuff. Look, life isn't really that complicated. It's not. There are some very simple commands and rules that you ought to just put in place for your life. The hard part is just following them. It's not complicated, though. It's simple. The hard part is fighting the flesh. The hard part is fighting the, the draw, the appeal to sin. That's where the hard part is. What the right choice is, is easy. That's the easy part. It's clear. It's black and white. Receive the warnings from Scripture. Look at Proverbs 23, verse number 19. The Bible says, Hear thou my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among winebibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. Have nothing to do with those people. Don't make those people your friends. Don't go joining yourself up to a bunch of drunkards. You may work in an industry or a job where a lot of people are you know, roughnecks. You may work on an oil field. You may work in construction. You may work as I did in a machine shop, right? Blue collar job. And you got a lot of people. It's just part of the culture that every Friday, hey, we're going out to happy hour and we're going to get drunk. Hey, come over to our poker party and, and smoke and drink. Look, stay away from it. There's going to be influences out there. We're, going to, we're, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Have nothing to do with it. Avoid it and avoid it at all costs. Look, don't get yourselves involved. Don't think, well, I'm a Christian. I'm stronger than that. I'll just go to this party. I'll just go to this area where everybody else is getting drunk and it won't affect me. Yes, it will. Don't think that you're that strong. Take heed lest you fall, please. Don't allow yourself to be put in those situations. Just avoid it altogether. Be not among winebibbers. There's no caveat. Be not among winebibbers. Among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. And drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Jump down to verse number 26. My son, give me thine heart. Give me thine heart. Why? Because we care about you. There's a father to the son. Give me your heart. I don't want to see you destroyed. Let thine eyes observe my ways. And, and parents, dads, don't be showing them the example that you're trying to tell them is the wrong way. Don't be the hypocrite because they'll follow your ways more than your words. 
For a whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. And we'll get into that in a minute. She also lieth in wait as for a prey, and increaseth the transgressors among men. Look at verse 29. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? Boy, doesn't that sound like a lot of fun? I want to have woe. Whoa, whoa, it doesn't just mean, you know, tell a horse to stop. Whoa, whoa is extreme sadness. Who is just really miserable? Who has sorrow? Who has content? Who just likes getting in a lot of fights? Man, that's just so much fun. I want to be miserable. I want to fight with a bunch of people. I want to just babble and just say stupid, meaningless things so that people can look at me like I'm an idiot because I'm just saying a bunch of dumb things and then I get in a fight with them when they call me dumb because I'm drunk. Who has wounds without cause? You wake up, well, how did that happen? Oh, I don't know. Boy, doesn't it sound like fun? Okay, the world's not going to tell you about this. The guys on the job aren't going to talk about this when they're talking about going out and getting drunk. They're not going to be talking about all these things that happen. Oh, come on out. Oh, what's the matter? Oh, goody two-shoes. Oh, well, you're too good. Look, don't fall for, for the stupidity and, and people trying to, to judge and question your manhood and try to mock you and make fun of you and pressure you into doing things that are wicked and sinful and wrong. Don't cave to that. Amen. Take this instruction to heart. Don't forget it. Who has all of these things? Verse 30, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, that's who has these things. That's what happens. Verse 31, Look not thou upon the wine when it's red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. And I don't care what anyone says. This is teaching. Don't be looking at booze. Amen. That's all it means. Don't you have to try to strain at a gnat and say, well, what do you mean when it moves and gives its color in the cup? And, you know, and try to add just confusion to what the simple teaching is, you know, you, you strain it in that, you swallow a camel if you're trying to say that this isn't teaching not to look at alcohol. Don't look at booze. Nothing to do with it. It, it. it goes in tune with all the rest of the scripture. It is in context. It's warning you about this stuff. Don't even look at it. Amen. Have nothing to do with it. Right. At the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Well, how much fun is that the last time you got a snake bite? I don't know if anyone's ever gotten a snake bite before. It's not a lot of fun. In case you needed to hear that. Right. In case you needed me to tell you. Yeah, snake bites, not fun. Not going to be a good day to get bitten by a venomous snake. It bites like a serpent. Thine eye, and it says, at the last. Right? So what people do, and this is, this is the foolishness, or oh, I'll just have a drink. Well, I'll just have one, right? One's not going to, look, I'm not going to become a drunk because I have a beer. Really? Every drunk you see out on the street, they started off having just one. All of them have. Oh, I'm just going to have one. Well, yeah, that bite, it says, at the last. It biteth like a serpent. So you say, well, I could just have one. I mean, what's, what's one going to do? One's going to make you want two. Right. Two's going to make you want to have three. Three's going to want to make you have four. And the more you have, the more your judgment goes. Because that's the way that booze works. And then, at the end, that's when you get the sting. That's when it bites like a serpent. That's when you really feel it. Look at verse 33. Thine eyes shall... Does it say your eyes might? No, thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Look, the Bible is true. Don't test it. Not when it comes to this. 
It's not worth it. Please, take it from someone who's been there. It's not worth it. Don't let that destroy you. You have your whole life in front of you. Don't get involved in drinking. There are people that get drunk and end up committing sins that put them to jail for the rest of their life. There are people that get drunk that, that ruin, that, that, that you know, allow them to contract diseases that they're going to have for the rest of their life. There are people that get drunk that sometimes end up losing their own lives because they do something stupid. They dive into a pool that's too shallow or into a lake and hit their head on a rock or do something just that you would never think is ever in a million years going to happen to you, it happens. And it happens way more often than, than you realize. And there's some people that just die of alcohol poisoning. Say, oh, those are extreme examples. Well, that's what happens. You know who that doesn't happen to? It doesn't happen to the person who's not going and getting drunk. It doesn't happen to the person who's not having their company around among wine bibbers. It doesn't happen to those people. Verse 34, Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? This is what alcohol does to you. It's going to make you feel like you're seasick from being on a boat. It's going to make you feel like, well, I got beat up and I don't even feel it. Some people think that's cool. Well, yeah, at the time you don't feel it, but you know what? When shall I awake? Who knows? When are you going to wake up from your stupor? When you awake, if you awake, when you awake, you'll feel it. You're going to feel all of it. And that's not something you want to experience. None of it is worth it. Because even the fun parts, your eyes are beholding strange women, your heart's uttering perverse things. And that's, that's the fun part. When shall I wake? I will seek it yet again. You know what part that is? That's the addictive part. You say, how in the world, after all this, why would anybody want to go and do that again? That's the deceitfulness of sin. And that is the power that alcohol has over people. You're dealing with stuff that you don't ever want to get involved with. It has that power. Whether you realize or not, just believe the Bible. It's talking about people seeking it again. Well, that doesn't sound good. I, th I would just quit after the first time doing it. Well, maybe. Maybe not. Because the way that it works, it's going to draw you back. You see people with addictions, you don't want to have an addiction like that. People who smoke and they know it's bad for me. Man, I can't do this. I'm killing myself. I've got this cough. When I get sick, it's 10 times worse because I can barely breathe. And they keep on going back and smoking those cigarettes. Become a slave to that sin. Alcohol, same thing. Drugs, same thing. People just, they, they wake up and their guts are hurting them. And they start having pains. And the only thing they think is going to help them is having more. And destroy their body and end up living out half their days. Don't even get involved in that. I have a relative, an extended relative, that when he was in college, young man, bright guy, had a great family and future ahead of him, was at a party and decided to try some acid, some LSD, some drugs. Now, I don't know all the details, if it was laced with anything or if it was just too high of a dose or whatever, but you know what happened to him? His mind went away and it's never come back. He still functions. But as a grown man, you know, 
older than, older than me by probably about 15 years, maybe 20 years, still needs to be watched over and, and cared for by his parents. Completely normal, everything. One time, one time is all it took. Just once. Don't get sucked into one time. In the youth, young people think, man, I'm resilient. I can do anything. Don't mess with it. Please, don't mess with it. Flip back to Proverbs chapter 7. I'm going way out of order with my sermon, but that's all right. Proverbs chapter 7. I'm just, I'm touching on two main sins. One of them is, is, the, is the booze and the alcohol, or the, the booze and the drugs, okay? And anything that we're reading about alcohol, you know, the drugs are at least as bad, if not worse, okay? And I don't care what society's trying to tell you, you know, oh, marijuana's not really that bad. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay, don't let anyone trick you into thinking, oh, it's not really that bad. I'll just have a joint to, you know. Look, just as the first beer is going to lead you to another, is going to lead you to another, is going to lead you to another, you start making exceptions. Well, you know, this is, you know, and, and trying to justify your sin. As soon as you open up that door, it's going to swing wide open. You never even intend on doing that. Without getting into details, because it is embarrassing, it's just one more area that I could speak from experience from, and you don't want to do that. You set boundaries for yourself. You think, oh, well, I'm only going to do this. And you know what? That works for a little while, but pretty soon, whatever it is where you set your boundary, well, let's see what that's all about. When you allow... You start going down that path of just allowing this stuff to impact you and affect you and you start getting into the drugs and you get you'll just start opening up more doors that you never thought you would because the, the deeper you get the further down you go there always seems to be somewhere you haven't been before well I wonder what that's like oh well I've done this and this wasn't that bad I wonder what this is like and then it gets old and then you move on and from your perspective, you don't see what you look like from the outside. You start making what you think are these small choices. Well, this isn't really that bad. And you keep going. But if you were to take a look back from the point where you started veering off and continuing down that path that doesn't seem much of a big deal to you, and then compare that to where you should have been, where, where just when you made that choice, well, I'm just going to have a beer. World of difference. Right. You're ending up way off in left field. How did I get here? I never thought I would, I would do cocaine, yet here am I, right. snorting lines of coke. Yep. How did this happen? Right. Man. I thought that that was crazy that people would do that drug. And here it is right in front of you. you say, what are you talking about, Pastor Bruce? I'm talking about what happens in reality That's right. when you start just opening the door and making bad decisions on sin. Right. And you know what? You don't need to have the experience even to tell other people that it's wrong and bad not to do it because we have God's word. Amen. That's right. I would much rather be able to hear, you know, it's better, I think it's even better to hear from someone who hasn't done those things right. and just say, yep, Bible said it and 
I'm living proof that this is a much better way because I didn't do those things. Then the person who did, I'm going to have to come up and be like, yeah, this is true. Everything it says here, I verified it. It's duh, it's true. And I was foolish enough to have to, to deal with all that. It's much better to have the example of, yeah, I believe that's true because I'm saved because I believe the Bible is God's word. So I'm just going to be wise and stay away from it. Proverbs chapter 7. The other sin I want to touch on, which is so common among the youth, besides the wanting to alter your senses and get drunk and do the drugs and everything else, is fornication. As you start becoming a man and a woman and you, and you have changes in your body and you start having the desires that you, that you want to, you know, find a mate, find someone to marry, find, find someone to be with for the rest of your life and you start feeling the, the, the lust of your flesh that you, you haven't known before and you feel like, well, I'm an adult now, watch out. Watch out. Make sure you do it the right way. God's way is you don't have the relationship of having a physical relationship with someone else until you're married. Mar until someone's willing to commit to you and you're willing to commit to them, we're not going to have this relationship until first we're promising it's till death do we part. Amen. We're vowing, we're staying together. Then we'll have that relationship. Look at Proverbs chapter 7, verse number 6. The Bible reads, For at the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths. He's looking at young people. He's looking out his window and he's saying, yep, there's all those young people. He says, a young man void of understanding. There's a foolish young guy right there. I could see it. He could see it from his window. There's a fool. There's one that just has no understanding whatsoever. Why? What does he see? Here's what he sees. Verse number eight, passing through the street near her corner. Her corner. Yeah, the person who has wisdom, it's not that hard to spot the whore. It's not that hard to, to spot the slut right. that's out there. When you have wisdom, you can spot it a mile away. And you know what? Thank God he provides wisdom in the scripture. It talks about this woman near her corner and went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot. There's one way of knowing yeah. her house, who that person, who this guy is just being really foolish with even dealing with her because she is wearing the attire of an harlot. Right. And men, when you're looking for a wife, your eyes may be drawn to the woman who looks like a whore because she doesn't, she's just not wearing a lot of clothing. But that is not the woman that you want to marry. Amen. The woman that is showing everything off for the whole world to see. Don't think you're special. She may try to make you think that you're special. Don't fall for it. It's a trap. Look what it says here. She's wearing a tire of a harlot and subtle of heart. Verse 11. We get a parenthetical statement here giving some attributes, some more attributes. How did this guy with wisdom know it was her, this, that she's a wicked person? Well, one, she's wearing the attire of a harlot. Look at verse number 11. She is loud and stubborn. Not attributes of a godly woman. Not attributes of a woman that you want to marry or be involved with. Loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Going off and getting involved in everyone else's business, being loud, being stubborn. Now she is without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me, this day have I paid my vows. She caught him and kissed him. Watch out for the forward women that are just seeking and trying to have this physical relationship. Oh, man. 
and just, just kissing and grabbing and touching and feeling and dressing like a harlot. Stay away from them. Why? They're trying to appeal to your flesh. They're just trying to suck you in. That's the goal. That's the motivation behind all of this. Watch out because one time of making a mistake and giving in to the desire in your flesh can change your life forever. You give in one time. You allow yourself, well, let's, I'm not going to do anything, but let's just see where this goes. I kind of want to tiptoe a little bit on this line of getting in sin, so I'm going to keep talking to this person that just came up to me and kissed me and she looks like a hooker. Right. <laughs> Instead of, nope. Right. And before you know it, like this man who's void of understanding, who wouldn't just get away, who wouldn't flee, you might end up contracting a disease. Now the person that you really love and they really want to, to spend your life with, you got to explain to that person, by the way, I have a filthy disease because I committed a filthy act in my youth. Or maybe you have a child with a person that they don't love you, they don't care about you, that's not the person you really wanted to marry, but man, she really appealed to my flesh. But I don't want to spend the rest of my life with that person. Are you kidding me? She's loud. She's stubborn. Yeah, I have nothing to do with her then. And now you're in this situation. Well, what are we going to do? And one sin leads to another. And then you get people talking about murder. Because you got yourself in a situation. Well, I can't murder so now what are we going to do? Do I get married to the loud, stubborn woman? Do I not? Do I, you know, life changed forever. No matter what choice you make, even if you make the best possible choice in the given situation, life changed forever. And it happens so fast. It's so easy to just make that bad choice and now the rest of your life is different. Didn't have to be that way. Listen to the word of God. And verse number 14, she's talking about peace offerings. Oh, yeah, I'm real spiritual. I love God, right? I've got my peace offerings. Verse 15, therefore came I forth to meet thee. Diligently seek thy face, and I have found thee. Look, it's you. You are the one I was looking for. Really? Me? Oh, me? You're looking just for me? The guy who's watching from his window. He's seeing her do that to every guy that walks by. But the foolish one is going, oh, me? Oh, wow. That's so nice of you. But listen, young people, this is real. Think about this. Let this sink in. Gain this wisdom and understanding. Don't be deceived. Because the women like this, they're looking for the easy mark in the target. It's a sport. The, 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 the adulteress, it's like a game to some of these women. They're looking to defile. There are children of the devil out there that are women that are and men is like, but, but looking to defile people. They see you. You're going to have a higher target on you. Oh, here's a Christian. Here's someone who's living right. Here's someone doing this. Oh, man, I can't wait to bring them down. This is the mindset of people who are just involved in wickedness anyways. Whether or not they're a reprobate, this is just kind of how people are. You go back to the drinking thing, you know, when everyone else is drinking, they, they just want to drag everyone else down with them. Oh, here, no, come on, have a drink. Oh, no, come on, do this. Come on, just be with, like one of us. They just want everybody around involved in whatever it is that they're doing. It's just the way it works. And then you get someone who doesn't do those things, and then it becomes more of a challenge. And you got the guys at work going, hey, you know, this guy's never had a drink in his life. Oh, man, you've got to come drink. I worked at a place with a, with a guy that was a virgin. And the guys all went out on a trip. 
to go to a hockey game because they're all into hockey. And they band it together and say, well, we're going we're gonna to get a prostitute for this guy because that's the way that they think. And this guy ended up being defiled with a prostitute because that's just the mindset. What? Look, watch out for that stuff. And I'm not like, you know, like I don't know much about that guy or anything else that, that you know, has, has happened since then, but this is the way that people operate. And especially people in the world and people who are just involved in their own filth, they want to bring you with them. That's why the Bible says, be not among the wine bibbers. Just, just don't even, don't allow that to happen. Yeah, if you got to work with people, you got to work with them. But stand your ground and don't give in and don't make the choices that are going to lead you down the wrong path. Verse number 16, I have decked my bed with co coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home. He has gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him, and he will come home at the day appointed. Listen to this. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. Okay. That all sounds really good. You convinced me. Her fair speech. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. Just laying on the flattery. Watch out for the flattery. Men and women, watch out for the flattery. It's one thing to get a compliment from someone, but when someone just will not let up with all the praise, all the compliments, it's called flattery. And when someone is flattering, there is always an ulterior motive. Always. They want to get something from you, which is why they're flattering. And with young people, oftentimes it's because they just want to get you in bed. They want something physical and they'll just lay it on thick. Girls, watch out for the guys that just ever do because they know that you're going to appreciate that. And they're, you're going to want to eat it. You're going to want to hear it. And guys, same thing. Guys love the praise of women. Have the wisdom to recognize the difference between a compliment and flattery. And that will help you to make good choices in your life. Watch out for it. She forced him with her flattering lips. Verse 22, he goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike, strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. All these things, just like a bird. Man, they fly full force into that trap that you've laid, but it's because they don't see that big spike that's laying there as they're, as they're going to, to swoop down. Why? Because you set a trap for them. You put whatever bait out there to, to lure them. They don't, they don't see the spike. So they're just going full force at it and then, oh, I'm dead. That's the analogy that God is using with the woman that flatters with her lips. With this adulterous, harlot type of a woman, he's saying, watch out, it's a trap. And it can destroy you. And you, you have no idea it's for your life. Because you're just falling into all this stuff and, and not not picking up on it like the guy who's looking out his window. He's not anywhere near that woman's corner. But he sees these other guys like, oh man, there's another dumb one falling for it. He's going to ruin his life. I'm like the guy in the window trying to, to warn you. Hey, watch out for these people. We, we have the attributes. The Bible tells us what they are. Don't get involved in that. It's a trap. Verse 24, Hearken unto me now, therefore, you children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Oh, but I'm strong. I won't give in. You don't know me. 
many strong men have been slain by her, killed. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. You want to talk about gravity, how serious this is, how serious of a teaching? God's saying, you know what? Her ways go to hell. Now, how much do you want to avoid hell? How many things in the scripture are just associated with just like, this is like going to hell. This is how serious it is. These paths lead to hell. Watch out for it. There is a good reason why this is so strongly worded in Scripture. One, because the appeal, the desire is strong, especially when you're young, to, to get involved in this stuff. Don't let it deceive you, entrap you, and trick you. Don't be the one who's kicking yourself later going, why did I do this? How could I let this stuff happen? How could I possibly? I've heard these things. I've known these things, yet I still did it. Don't be that person. Don't be that person. Those people exist. Don't be that person. You have a choice. You don't have to be that person. I hope you have better visions for your life. I hope you have better plans for your life. Take heed. Don't just think you're going to put everything off. Think about these things now and just decide, I'm going to go this way. I'm going to go the right way. I'm going to learn this wisdom. I'm going to listen to my parents who love me and care about me and they're trying to teach me. I'm going to listen to what they have to say. I thank God for my wife. My wife told me that she'd never done drugs in her life. Why? Because her mom told her that it was wrong and it was bad. I thank God that she had the respect to listen to her mother to say, you know what? This is bad for you. Thank God. She never went down that road because mom said, don't do it. Boy, I wish I would have thought the same way. Instead, I have to stand up here and just tell you that this is wrong, not just because the Bible says so, because there's stupid people that don't always hear and don't always listen to what the Bible has to say. And it's true. Yeah. Turn to Psalm 144. It's the last place I'll have you turn tonight. I'm already running out of time here. The last point that I was going to make is, you know, especially for young people, take heed to who your friends are. Because your friends have influence on you. Who you're going to invest in, spend time with, talk to, share your own secrets with, get to know, you know, become good buds with. Be careful. Because you're going to care about those people. They're your friend. But when you make friends with the wrong people, people who are foolish, people who aren't saved, people who don't have the Spirit of God, people who aren't wanting to live for God, who have nothing to do with God, don't make friends with those people. They're just going to drag you down. They're going to they're influence you more to make bad choices. And the example, the great example in Scripture is Amnon. Amnon already had a problem with a sinful lust but Amnon wasn't acting on his lust. Amnon wasn't actually going that far as to do anything about it until he got the advice from his friend. Amnon had a friend. And that friend, hey, here's what you do. I'm going to lay it all out for you. And then, of course, well, I didn't do it, you know. But he influenced him just enough to push him over the edge to commit a really horrible act which really changed his life forever. It killed him. It caused his own, he caused his own death because he had the wrong friends combined with his own wicked lust. But it just, that just shows you, I mean, you could be teetering and a friend's going to push you the wrong way. As a youth, hey, choose to do right. Don't give in to the flesh. We have plenty of examples of youth doing right in Scripture. Well, look at David. David was a youth. He was, he was called a youth when he went and fought against Goliath. Hey, that's a youth. 
That's someone who God was really working in him and using him and doing great things with a youth. And David has his own sin that he committed later on. But he was going the right way for a long time and started in his youth. Why don't you have the desire to do that? Look at, look at Psalm 144, verse number 11. The Bible says, Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children whose mouth speaketh vanity and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. It says, rid me, deliver me of those strange children. I don't know those children. They're not, that's not the way I'm raising my children. Rid me of those children that, that have the, the, the mouth that just speak vanity and the right hand is the right hand of falsehood. He says that our sons may be as plants growing up in their youth. I don't want those children impacting our children. Parents, watch out who your children are spending time with. It's your job to protect them. Watch out for them. That our sons may be as plants growing up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace, that our garners may be full, affording all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets. What are you talking about? Blessing. Just being blessed. We, we don't want those kids around our kids because we want our kids to grow up right. We want them to be like cornerstones, to be polished, to have these blessings. Instead of the cursings of sin, I want my children to be blessed. I don't want them to have to deal with all those cursings. Verse 14, that our oxen may be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in nor going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. Happy is that people that is in such a case, yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. We need to do a better job of getting through to our youth and making sure they understand the, the full consequences of their actions. I'm sure I'm not alone in this thought, but man, if I could have just heard some fiery preaching as a youth about some of these sins... I, I wish that I just had the fire scared out of me to get involved in any one of these things because they're not worth it. Not for a second, they're not worth it. You ought to be scared about getting involved in these sins. You ought to be. If you're not, you're foolish. You're not listening. You're not listening to, to people who've been through it and you're not listening to God's word. The language is strong for a reason. You ought to be scared to death to commit fornication. You ought to be scared to death to get involved in drinking and drugs. That ought to scare you so much. Just the, 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 the negative impact that it's going to have on your life that you're going to avoid it at all costs. That's what I want for our youth today. Don't forget these things. Please. Keep them with you. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the warning and instruction that you give us. Lord, help us to, to have the strength and the courage to um, continue to read and study, Lord, and not to, to get complacent or even um, just, just have a bad attitude about, about following your words, dear God. I pray that you would please just help all of us parents in the room tonight. Uh, to be able to raise our children right and instruct them and show them and to be diligent about it and, and to not uh, to let up, but to be able to talk about your words and instruction for them because it's so important from the time they're young until the time they're ready to, to leave and start their own life, dear Lord, help us. Help us to impart knowledge and wisdom unto them, dear Lord, and that, and that we can help this next generation to not have to go through many of the things that so many people have already gone through, Lord. Help us to, to show them the right way and to give them the best start that they can have, Lord. And, and please help these children to, uh, this, the youth that we have here, 
in this room to be able to take heed to the warnings and, and to, to treat it with the seriousness that, that you treat it with, Lord. And I pray that you please bless our church, bless the families, God, and, uh, and help us just to, to do what's right. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.